My name is Eric Alexander, and I'm the executive director of the Brigham Education Institute. And for those who have not been to any of our programs before, we are um, uh, kind of an internal uh, institute within the Brigham and Women's Hospital just down the street here in Boston and uh, really seeking to just create community around all of us who enjoy the process of being a healthcare educator and then in any way to kind of grow that skill set. Um, but not to take any more time, it's my pleasure to uh, really welcome and thank Paul for joining us here today and being willing to give this uh, very interesting talk. So uh, Paul is the Associate Dean for Health Sciences and a Professor of Health Professions Education at Simmons University, uh, just down the street from the Brigham and Women's Hospital. And we're so excited to kind of bring us regionally one step more connected. Paul uh, And Paul's an expert here really on clinical thinking and reasoning. Uh, and there's so much here. That's a very broad topic. And I really uh, am excited myself to hear this, really understanding how context will shape and impact so much of what we do. And I think we see that throughout all aspects of kind of uh, teaching and learning, certainly as it relates to healthcare. So with that, Paul, I'm going to stop sharing. I want to thank you again for taking time with us, and uh, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Eric, um, for this opportunity. I've been a kind of tangential uh, friend of the BI since I started here at Simmons in the fall, attending as many of these uh, types of events as possible and, and trying to become part of the community. So thank you to past director Christina Darza, who's moved on, um, for the invite. So um, my, my goal is to, is to talk a little bit and then have some time for Q&A, and we have a little bit of, a, of, of an action event embedded within. Um, but uh, just a quick background on me, I know we have a mixed crowd here, probably a lot of healthcare professions represented. Um, my background is athletic training. I've been in the field for a long time. Uh, I was a clinician for a long time for a while in various settings, and then got into higher education program and administration about 25 years ago at two different institutions. Uh, now I'm out of teaching um, formally as associate dean in that field, but that's uh, that's my context, and um, that's where I'm coming from. So there's that word already, context. So th there'll be a lot of examples throughout the day where, if you believe in transferability, my hope is that you can transfer my examples and my context to yours, whether it's uh, medicine or different parts of medicine, uh, whether it's physical therapy, occupational therapy, et cetera, because we may have um, some different professions represented. So. That's the context of where I'm coming from. Um, the goal is today is just to have a conversation uh, about uh, a clinical reasoning framework and talk about the need for that a little bit. Um, maybe be a little more specific. And if you see the subtitle of my talk, Diagnostic versus Therapeutic versus Contextual, you can already kind of gather there's three pillars that I'm going to address. Um, and then obviously the interactions between those various facets. Um, and then obviously focus most of the time on contextual reasoning. And again, uh, Dr. Artino, who's speaking on May 24th, who Eric just, uh, just um, showed you about, is actually one of the experts. And you'll see his name a lot in the, uh, some of the citations that I have. I did send a PDF of this presentation to the BEI, and, and they're happy, uh, they're, they're more than welcome to share that with folks. So all the references and citations will be in there. Um, and you're, of course, welcome to do the easier way of taking screenshots of certain papers that you might see that you want to go grab. So the overall goal is to kind of continue uh, the conversation about how do we teach and learn uh, clinical reasoning in various contexts. And so how do we deliver it? How do we assess it? Which ob obviously is the kind of goal of uh, anybody involved in, in, in HPE. For those of you who don't know athletic training, and there's probably a lot, uh, but we've been an allied health profession since about 1990, recognized by the AMA. Uh, so we're part of the really the sports medicine umbrella. The name's a little confusing. We don't just work with athletes anymore. We don't really just do a lot of training. Um, so that's one of the professional issues, but we don't have time for that. But these are the five domains of practice. And, and just real quickly, overview wise, um, you know, athletic training um, is really responsible for anything that can happen. Anybody doing something physical is really kind of a, a bumper sticker. So from, you know, the, the classic ankle sprains and strains, sprains on automobiles, if you will, to, you know, potentially fatal um, life altering events like exertional heat, heat stroke and hyponatremia and concussion and fractures, dislocations, C-spines, those sorts of serious things don't happen often, but can, and those are all in our domain of practice. The other thing important about athletic training is, you know, if you're at with the Celtics or the Patriots, et cetera, you have great, you have great resources. You can get advanced imaging in the locker room. You can, you have physicians and all sorts of resources. A lot of athletic trainers at high schools and smaller colleges don't have that uh, at their disposal. So clinical reasoning, diagnostic reasoning in particular, and an on-field event, um, are particularly important because of the difference in context. In this case, 
uh, and environment. So um, I, I like to try to throw something new in every talk that I do. And so one of my one of my papers I read um, came up with this uh, neat little find. And Dr. Habas is actually a 10th century Persian physician that wrote a medical textbook, and it has a chapter on clinical reasoning. So it's been around for um, quite a bit of time. And, and I'm, a fr- I'm a friend of the old adage that there's really no such thing as an original idea, it's just a matter of when and where you might find it or come across it. So uh, the idea of clinical reasoning in medical education has been around for quite a while. So if it's been around for 1,100 years or so, you might ask, well, why are we still talking about it? Well, it's clear from a a series of papers, and and I'm only going to highlight a couple here, but and they're not all old either. They're all from even a year or two ago, still papers coming out in the med literature about the difficulties we still have. And um, when I say we, I'm talking larger scope health professions and including um, everybody within that. But obviously, most of the literature and research is coming from kind of the top of the pyramid there with med ed. But we still have, you know, a lot of challenges with um, defining clinical reasoning, with operational definitions, with terminology, um, with uh, comparing different types and different uh, sorts of clinical reasoning. And from a personal perspective, um, you know, I I found the same thing. And so in 2009, my colleague Todd Lazeby and I wrote this paper, the first of its kind in athletic training literature, out of some frustration and some need. And mostly, you know, there was a lot of literature in our journals coming out about critical thinking. And I just started to wonder, is there a better phraseology for the the cognitive processes that athletic trainers must do? And so I, I went to the top of the mountain, if you will, and went to med ed. And um, ironically, or coincidentally, if you will, uh, our paper came out the same year as did Cross Gary's kind of seminal work on on two systems that later uh, perfected by uh, Norman and, and others. Um, so, but we did the same thing. So we we talked only about diagnostic reasoning again, which was my my first kind of entry point into the into the scholarship of the field, if you will. So our goal was to try to introduce the concept, to create a language, to create a model for educators, for program directors to look at their what drives their system. Right, if you think about the operating system of a curricula. Um, and we pretty much differentiated uh, hypothetical deductive reasoning from case pattern recognition and talked about the fluid spectrum between the two, the differences, the challenges, you know, a little bit of expert versus novice thinking. Uh, but we didn't talk at all about context and we didn't talk at all uh, about therapeutic reasoning. So I, I do have a fair bit of clinical experience and I kind of kept my hands in that as a program director. And then I started to think about, you know, um, what about all the times when you you answer a student's response, a student's question with, well, it depends, hence the, the, the initial part of this title, and start to realize it happens a lot more often. So we weren't the only ones. And then it, again, there's some of these big names that you see uh, in med ed and a series of papers, um, systematic reviews, scoping reviews, et cetera, looking at what does the literature say? And one thing over here, you can see that in, in the, the health professions that are represented in, in this scope and review by Young et al., um, just in 2020, uh, athletic training is not there. So, of course, I took that a little hard, but uh, understandable. So there are about a dozen papers, uh, uh, the last time I looked, that specifically talk about clinical reasoning in athletic training. So that's not a lot for a profession that's been around since 1950. So we have a way to go in athletic training, but you still see that there's there's still a lot of, of need to come up with a more homogenous um, language and, and conceptual model uh, uh, for clinical reasoning in order to um, really um, standardize loosely, uh, but more operationalize it educationally, and then even more importantly to for researchers, right? So to be able to compare different types of research approaches, different artifacts, uh, and, and et cetera. Um, again, this paper here is even newer. It talks about a need for a longitudinal clinical reasoning of both teaching and assessment from an international standpoint. You see that the, this fairly recent paper, 2020, uh, out of 313 responses in 70, 76 countries, only 28% actually reported having a longitudinal cr- clinical reasoning curriculum, but yet 85% said you, you, we need one. Um, 19% weren't sure uh, if, if they did, had one or not. Um, and the most popular assessment, of course, was the OSCE that most folks are familiar with, about 80% uh, of the folks who have a longitudinal clinical reasoning curriculum use OSCEs. Uh, and yet there was also a lot of subjective interpretation and need for more work-based assessment of clinical reasoning. So WAs certainly. Um, why do we not have this more universally? 
and I say we, it's really the medicine. Well, number one reason is a lack of awareness. Number two is a lack of guidelines. How do we do it? What do we do? What should we do and not do? Uh, and then the ubiquitous lack of qualified faculty. So almost 60% say we still don't have the faculty qualified and, and trained in order to really make a, a 360 double helix model, if you will, for clinical reasoning uh, in the curriculum, which is what we did in the athletic training program at Ithaca College that I directed for the last 16 years. Um, it's still a working process, but that's really the system that we set up before I, I left to come here to Simmons. So definitely a need for more faculty development. You see here that there's a lot of focus on the top part of this table on the differential diagnosis, the diagnostic reasoning. And again, uh, as I did this search a few years ago and started this, the, there's thousands of articles on diagnostic reasoning and not so many on therapeutic or management reasoning. There are more in the last few years, but you see a, a strong bias towards um, <clears throat> teaching and assessing and the relevant factor with diagnostic reasoning and it, the numbers get a little lower and we start to get down towards um, management reasoning when we get down to theories you know the models and then again as ipe is really important for many of us uh, to to generate better ipp um, that's something that has not been addressed very often even though i think it has a lot to do with context right so what other professionals are around you when you're when you're going through a diagnostic challenge or when you're going through a therapeutic or management challenge i think that's something that is a wide open field for research because uh, you bring into play conflicts power dynamics um, roles and responsibilities and those sorts of things so another very specific um, research and the authors sum up this paper with, uh, we need a much more explicit emphasis on clinical reasoning across the curriculum um, versus uh, implicit that we're doing it and we think we're doing it. So need more, more work on teaching, need more work on assessment, need more work on faculty development. And then this paper here, just last year, uh, just one last one, there are many more. I just selected a handful uh, from Durning and colleagues uh, who've done a lot of work on clinical reasoning and, and contacts. You'll see Renchik, Renchik's name again. He's got a more specific model he came out with, but same, same argument here. Um, we have a wide, array, a wide array of terms being used, uh, methodologies to assess. Uh, therefore, we have challenges with, with validating different artifacts and different approaches to assessing it. And, you know, just kind of as, as a side, you know, I, I pay attention to this as much as I can. I follow a lot of podcasts, a lot of webinars, many through the BEI. And, and even in listening to those uh, those educational moments, it, 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 I've seen at least four or five times where interchangeably clinical reasoning and diagnostic reasoning are used. Uh, the speaker will be talking about clinical reasoning on, on a broad sense and then boom, just flip gears and, and only specifically talk about diagnostic reasoning. And I can I don't know if I can count on even on one hand the number of times I've heard them uh, bring in therapy reasoning or context. So um, that kind of spurred me to start reading and digging up more. And, and if you do, you realize there actually is a lot of literature on contextual reasoning and, and an increasing and emerging volume of, of literature on management or therapeutic reasoning. This paper was helpful to me. It it's goes to 2013, so almost a decade old now. So Goldschmidt and uh, one of the fathers of clinical reasoning, uh, Dr. Bordage from the University of Illinois, um, kind of, again, you see the conclusions here. The point of this paper was to, to get a more unified list of vocabulary so that, so that teaching and assessment um, could be more standardized and we could have a better kind of top-down approach and, and be, be talking the same language, have apples to apples, comparisons, et cetera. And so they came up with these four major categories, framing the encounter. Uh, the sub items you see here are from the article and some of my own additions from reading other articles and my own experiences, my own perspective, but um, four major categories, framing the encounter, and, you know, in athletic training, that could be on the field when an acute emergent situation, and if we saw the mechanism, you know, an athlete jump and get undercut and land on his head, if we see the mechanism, that's very helpful as we approach the athlete on the field to framing the encounter, and that's where it starts. Um, to a clinical situation where an athlete walks in and says, you know, can you take a look at my back? It's been bothering me and now it's worse. And I've had this for three months. So that entire spectrum from the acute, emergent, potentially really dangerous or fatal situation on the field or on the rink or in the gymnastics uh, training session to the more mundane, if you will, you know, low back pain that a high percentage of Americans have and, and those sorts of things. So um, that's framing the encounter starts and that's the context within AT and not, not, uh, not universally, of course, but just as an example. 
And then, of course, you see the diagnostic reasoning part. And then the management reasoning, the first thing you might notice on a management category is that there's a lot more stuff there. So right away, it kind of suggests that it's a little more complicated, but perhaps that there's more room for contextual factors and contextual reasoning in the management process. Uh, but it also is a little slower uh, because we, again, in athletic training, we, we were with one of the advantages were with an athlete the day they get hurt. We often then see them once or even twice a day for a period of time um, versus in medicine. I'm not sure that happens unless, of course, they're in the hospital, but in a clinical situation. And then, you know, all the way to return to play. So there's a lot more involved there in management. And then at the self-reflective part, which we all know is important for growth mindset, um, development of expertise, adaptive expertise, and those sorts of things. But it, it really overgirds everything you see there, right, in self-reflecting and recreating um, situations, whether you got a diagnosis wrong <clears throat> or um, patients not advancing as quickly or as well as you might like them to. Um, and you have to reflect back on what did you miss? So the key features that you missed is, is, is it a zebra uh, hoof prints uh, versus a horse? Um, are there comorbidities? Uh, those sorts of things. So this is a good article to start with to look at if you want to kind of categorize and think about what am I going to teach? What part am I teaching? What part am I assessing? Whether that's didactically or clinically. So, you know, this is the basic clinical reasoning model from our friends in nursing, and it, it's pretty complete, right? It looks like, you know, we start with patient considerations, and then we collect information, we go with DDX, we work on diagnostic reasoning, come up with a formidable or working diagnosis, and then we figure out what to do with it. We still have a short-term goals, long-term goals. And again, the context of the situation is an acute injury, is potentially something nefarious going on um, versus something that's a little more mundane. And then we go to the left side of this process and we look at the management part and we evaluate outcomes, hopefully over time. And then we reflect on that. So even though it's a circular model, it's pretty linear, pretty complete, right? So um, what's missing? Is it this, is it this simple? Is it, is it this um, basic uh, and stepwise format in order to teach. And those of us who have been in the field for a while know that that's not the case. So what, what's missing is, is to think about the number of times you, you respond to a student, a trainee, uh, and when they ask you, should we do this? How come we didn't do this? Or should we go ahead and try this? And you start your response with, well, it depends. And I just started thinking of that in the last few years and think, okay, if you start a, a response to uh, a debriefing with a trainee, whether they did it or whether you did it and they're watching um, and you start your answer, well, depends to me, you're automatically walking through the corridor of, of context. So I started with this real simple model. A friend of mine, Pat McKean at Ithaca is really big on models and diagrams and graphics. And so I started playing around a little bit and I said, okay, there's more than just diagnostic reasoning. There's something called therapeutic or management reasoning, and it's very different. So I started looking at that a few years ago and there weren't a lot of papers on it, to be frank. Uh, and then of course, later on, I thought about the context part. So to me, this very simple integrated Venn model um, shows you that there's interrelationships between the three and that clinical reasoning is represented by some interaction of, of the three. So there's the simplest model. And I, I, I worked on a more complex model as time went on. But again, athletic training, just as examples, whether you have you know, a, an adolescent female athlete that's playing high school sports, and so you're worried about growth plate issues and those sorts of things, or a professional athlete that's growth plates have closed, and you know they may have the same injury, an anterior cruciate ligament injury, but there's context involved in how you actually do your, your assessment. And, and obviously, your, your differential diagnosis is different based on populations um, in, in some cases. Um, you also, athletes, a lot of our students learn how to assess injuries you know, on a court or field what happens when they go work with hockey right so how do you assess and manage and stabilize um, in a different context of a situation like that um, as i said earlier you know there's a lot of gen med issues in athletic training that we're responsible for from exertional uh, heat stroke to you know asthma attacks to anaphylaxis to rhabdo uh, sickle cell you name it anything that can happen to an athlete in active active space so um, you know, we teach our athletes or students how to do spine boarding for a suspected C-spine fracture on a stable surface. Well, again, what if they're working hockey or what if they're working gymnastics in a tumbling pit where you're with a bunch of foam balls and, and foam squares? So that those contextual things are important, not just for diagnostic reasoning, but also as you get into management reason, once you diagnose something on the field and you're working with a differential, um, what are your management decisions before you start providing actual care or, or make a decision? 
I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because a, one, we don't have the time. B, I think most people here are probably familiar with the, the most dominant model for clinical reasoning when it comes to diagnostic reasoning. And that's cross Gary's model and then perfected later by Norman. And the two system or type one, type two with uh, CPR and HDR, which again came out about the same time our paper did. And we kind of reflected it in, unintentionally. Um, but um, so just we're going to leave that kind of there for now. We're not going to spend a lot of time on diagnostic reasoning because of uh, the plethora of literature available. And coincidentally, just yesterday, Jennifer Spicer, who's an MD and internal medicine doc at Emory, um, had a really nice Twitter uh, explanation on diagnostic reasoning, a 10 or 12 uh, tweet uh, presentation, if you will, on diagnostic thinking. So uh, if you look up her, Jennifer Spicer, MD, MPH, uh, you, can, you can get a little teaser on that. But I think one thing that is important that maybe is not talked about enough is uh, students can't really do two things at the same time, right? And so especially novices or pre-novices, <clears throat> I think sometimes, and I know we were guilty of this, we were guilty of, of trying to rush our students into type one um, thinking. And then we started to realize, you know what? No, they should graduate as novices, transition to practice, being capable or competent with type two. Uh, maybe in some exposures with ankle sprains or other injuries I've seen a while, they could be move, using type one. And again, it's contextual, right? So we started to realize that based on experience and deliberate practice, um, some students can be using type one in one situation and then type two in another. And that's especially relevant when a student goes from, let's say, work on a volleyball rotation. They have a lot of upper extremity injuries and patellar tendonitis and maybe some ankle sprains. And then maybe they go with gymnastics. And now all of a sudden they have a lot of low back and a lot of C-spine injuries. And we know through a lot of work in med ed that that doesn't transfer that diagnostic reasoning ability doesn't transfer and so they may shift from one to two uh, based on their exposure but i think it's important to, to emphasize that the quote up top from pinnock and that um, you have to develop the illness scripts first in order to then be able to analyze and collect data at the same time and that just makes sense because you know scientists collect the data and then analyze them right so i think we need to kind of slow down a little bit when it comes to diagnostic reasoning not expect our, our novices especially in new context new environments to analyze and collect data at the same time which i I think is consistent with uh, the deductive and abstract process of type two. But we'll spend a little bit of time than I did more time on, on management reasoning or therapeutic reasoning than I did on, on diagnostic because of a couple of reasons. One is more complicated. Two is there's not nearly as much literature. And if you look at the work from Derning and Trevino and Cook in this paper and, and others, they, they specifically come out and say it that we need more work done. So um, Therapeutic reasoning, sometimes known as management reasoning. <clears throat> I don't know if there's a better term. One's better than the other or not. Um, it's generally understudying in comparison to diagnostic reasoning. Um, we know that it, there's greater reliance on the basic and advanced sciences, especially if you're using type one reasoning, which is intuitive and you're going off a reflection or recognition of key features that match a case pattern. But you really want to, you know, in athletic training, again, are you going to use ultrasound or electrical stimulation or laser therapy or movement therapy or manual therapy? You're going to use cold, you're going to use ice, right? So there's, there's a lot of, of basic and clinical sciences, physiology, physics, et cetera embedded within those decisions when you when you make a, a therapeutic plan to treat someone whether it's an acute injury or chronic injury or, or subacute to that effect um, on the other hand sometimes it's easier to measure if you're paying attention with uh, patient reported outcomes and clinician reported outcomes over time with many reassessments if someone's pain's going down or inflammation's going down their weight bearing ability is going up range of motion is going up we know that it's working now it may be a series of, of luck in nature and the body's ability to heal um, it may be because of the interventions that, that are being applied by the clinician this paper from 2019, I just found recently, and I would refer you to it as probably the best place to start. And again, I haven't done a thorough, complete, systematic review of the literature, but this paper is very nicely organized, very well written. Uh, again, you see uh, Derning and Sherbino there, uh, some of the big names uh, with clinical competence and clinical reasoning and those sorts of things. Um, I would challenge one little, one of their summative points, and I just kind of went through a little bit. Here they say that, you know, diagnostic reasoning kind of operates outside of contextual constraints. And again, it may in medicine, uh, but athletic training, I would challenge and say that's not the case, and given some of the examples I've provided with the many different settings, different demographics, uh, without really the ability to have specialized imaging at hand, you know, that, that comes when we refer to our, our supervising physician and, and those sorts of things. But on the field and in the moment, we have to use more of what's up here uh, and less technology. And they do point out very clearly that, you know, therapeutic or, or management reasoning is, is much more complex. There's more factors involved. <clears throat> and, and then there's that big phrase at the bottom with context in the biopsychosocial context. 
So uh, they, they, one of the summative points of this paper is that we really need to uh, dig a little deeper um, when we're not only um, teaching in the class and, and whether it's theory and practice with the didactic component of a curricula, but more specifically when we're clinically talking to a student, a trainee, and trying to assess uh, their decision-making um, in a work-based assessment. Um, they came up with these uh, subcompetencies, which are really quite logical. Um, but it also shows you how different it is from diagnostic reasoning. Um, and some of the highlights there, it's complex. You have to look at context and inter interaction of various contextual factors, the aspect of time and monitoring. So these are some of the main uh, differences and subcompetencies within management reasoning. Um, that, of course, we're all time stretched, right? So I imagine in a, in a busy ER or inpatient situation, um, this is why some of these things aren't done as much as, as, as they could be. Um, and even athletic training and physical therapy, I know that time is, is a critical resource. So uh, a good source of things to think about when you're debriefing with the student and you're assessing his or her um, management reasoning. And so I kind of took a lot of that information and brought it into this kind of easy graphic, infographic of at least six different ways. And you could say there's more than six in here, and that's fine. But uh, try to keep it simple. You know, when we do, when we start a plan of care in athletic training, we're assuming we have an accurate diagnosis. Uh, now, sometimes we have it. Maybe it's a, a grade one, uh, it's an MCL sprain of the knee, uh, but we may underestimate or overestimate the severity. So maybe it's a grade one and we think it's a grade two, two plus or vice versa. And so that impacts their, our therapeutic management decision. Um, and then so you see a lot of other things that are similar to the last slide. Resources available, you know, high school athletic trainer doesn't have the same resources as uh, the Boston Celtics head AT. You know, maybe a rural physician doesn't have the same uh, uh, resources as someone here in Boston. Uh, I'm sure you all have different contextual examples. So patient values and decision-making over in the fourth pillar here on the gold, first gold one, uh, makes it a lot more complicated. Some patients may not want to do things. They may not have resources to do things um, financially, um, physically, et cetera. It, it is very fluid, ongoing process. They could get worse, uh, could have comorbidities existing, et cetera. And then we obviously have time to make decisions and reflect and look at our chart, uh, look at our patient notes um, to any to consult with others. So those are some of the major differences between DXR and TXR. Um, if you look at patient alliance, therapist patient alliance, and some of those personal factors in the last two slides, uh, yes, they've been studied. And you actually see that there's some large emerging systematic reviews that show a lot of outcomes with very common conditions, like in this case, low back pain. Uh, that context does matter. So uh, science is not as exact. Medical science is not as perfect and exact as we might think. So despite what we might do, a lot of it comes down to contextual factors, like uh, what kind of language is used, um, what kind of cueing we use to teach patients how to avoid pain and what things are okay, what things are not okay. The difference between pain and soreness, for example. Uh, and then of course, personality characteristics, positivity, enthusiastic, um, simple language, communication, all those things that go towards what our friends in OT are, are very, very strong with in particular with, with the patient therapist alliance. And so not just one factor at a time, but if you have multiple factors involved, um, it certainly changes on the outcome. Um, so on the left is just an infographic of this paper. And it shows you that up to, you know, up to 75%, uh, even up to 91%, really, but if we split it, 75% of, 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 of patients improvement with pain and mobility and range of motion are due to non-specific or, or contextual factors. So um, trust and respect and, and word usage and those sorts of things. So um, pretty interesting data there as well. You also see more studies. Another one, osteoarthritis, that's up to you know around 65% of the treatment effect is due to contextual factors. Uh, placebo, nocebo, for example, co-therapies, uh, natural history, right? The body's ability to, to heal on its own. We don't know what patients do when they're not with us. They might be taking other meds. They might be doing other exercises. They might be getting acupuncture. They may be getting massage, all those sorts of things. So it's not all internally controlled. And then this really large study here, meta research, looking at all conditions uh, up to uh, uh, up to uh, 90, uh, 76, uh, 76%, uh, 54%, excuse me. Of, of outcome effects are due to contextual factors, due to interpersonal relations and, and those sorts of things. So uh, if we really wanna dive into what's missing and that's contextual reason, this uh, scholar from artificial intelligence, Fausto Gianchilia, uh, I don't know if I pronounced that right, Fausto Gianchilia, um, way back in 97 is one of the foremost experts on contextual reasoning. Again, more from a computer AI perspective, but uh, the, the simple, simple take home point is that um, you know, contextual reasoning is, is the subjective um, snapshot 
um, aspects of our experiences, right? So, you know, if you think about capital T truth versus small t truth, you know, contextual reasoning is, is the ag uh, amalgamation of the small t truths of our experiences, right? And if we think about anything that's profound in our life, what do we do? We go back and reconstruct it. We reflect on the context. Why did you make a certain decision? Why did you miss something? Not just in, in medical or clinical practice, but also in life. So it's, it forces us to consider too much irrelevant detail if we try to um, and capture the whole thing. So Bordage, who I was the first folks I read when I started doing clinical reasoning research, and he talked about key features and features that don't fit. And so, you know, what are the key features of a known case? And are there anything here that doesn't fit the case that might make you think of a zebra uh, here in zebra hooves, or might make you think of something else nefarious? So um, I think contextual reasoning is a good place to start. And again, it's not new. It's none of this is really my stuff. I'm just trying to encapsulate stuff together and, and look at transferability, but all the way back to 2003. And I, I think even Elstein talked about contextual reason way back in 1978 in one of his early papers. Uh, but Kevin Eva um, has done a lot on context specificity and, and point out uh, that, um, you know, things don't transfer. And Norman, of course, talked a lot. Jeff Norman talked a lot about um, transferability. We know that uh, certain expertises don't. And based on Thorndike's work in 1923, under the assumption that Latin would transfer to other forms of learning and knowing, there's quite a bit of literature suggests that um, specific expertise does, does not uh, transfer to different um, uh, places. Which led me to this more complicated model. And you're free to take a snapshot of that if you want. And so over on the left, you see the system one and two uh, spectrum for diagnostic reasoning. In the top right, you see therapeutic reasoning, which for AT purposes, I broke down into management. Again, go back to the on-field situation. You got a working diagnosis. And you, how do I manage the situation? Do I activate emergency action plan? Do I stabilize? Do I mobilize? Do I put a vacuum splint? Or do I let the person leave the field on their own power? And then we often have a secondary evaluation where we redo a, a diagnostic reasoning. So a very constant interchange in an athletic training setting. Again, sometimes, often that's without the benefit of other providers' help, physicians, uh, or advanced diagnostics and those sorts of things. And so nowadays you're seeing those tents on the sideline of big athletic events. And that's kind of one of the reasons is to kind of eliminate some of the uh, distractions that, that, that are created and of course for patient protection as well, but management reasoning. And then, then we slide into interventional reason. What am I going to do for this athlete? You know, do I put them on a brace to put them in a splint? Do I, do I ice it? Do I heat it? Do I put them on crutches? Um, do I refer for diagnostic imaging? And then once we do have a diagnosis, there's that interchange. Uh, okay. What are we doing about it? So come to therapy tomorrow and we'll do X, Y, and Z from that point, all the way to return to play again, from something as mundane as a hamstring strain to, you know, anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction surgery approach. But the big wheel, the big cog here on purpose that you see in the bottom is contextual reasoning. And to me, that's what drives the other two. And I think we need to, and, and to point out and focus more on what are the context of the situation when we're dealing with students. So we teach them the gray spaces, the chaotic spaces, and to get them to be comfortable in that, which we know is important for productive struggle uh, and for adaptive expertise. So, um, what you see is that this is not new, right? In 2012, again, there's Stephen Durning and, and big wigs here, Lambert Shorth and Case Vanderluten and Anthony Dartino, again, who's speaking on the 24th and the next session of, of this BEI installment. Um, he, I'm looking forward to that. And they really started to uh, put this on paper, again, almost a decade ago. Uh, well, an actual decade ago. So context specificity, working off of Norman's work and Ava's work. Um, context weaving together, situated cognition and ecological psychology from our friends in psychology as very apropos concepts, theoretical frameworks to bring into play. Uh, and then cognitive load theory, which many of us are familiar with, when, it, especially with novices about overloading um, the mind during uh, an experience. If it's a slow controlled experience, cognitive load theory is less of an issue. If it's chaotic emergency room, or maybe you're, it's a student athletic trainer in the field in front of 100,000 people at a bowl game, and I'm the preceptor and I say, go, you do this on-field evaluation, that's, that's pretty pretty over, overwhelming to the student from a cognitive load perspective, as well as to um, the amount of uh, contextual interference that we might be providing. So this paper put this very simple model forward and starts to dig a little deeper into the various pillars, if you will. So um, Derning's model here, all the way back from, from 2012, looks at the physician, 
<clears throat> he or she, right? And where they're all human, of course, you know, are they tired today? Are they feeling a little under the weather? Um, you know, where's their well-being? What's their mood state? You know, did they just get yelled at by the supervisor? You know, they're having stress with, with, with family or marital relationships, all those things that are normal, right? Of course, the patient, which is what we're focusing on. And, and we have to have a larger scope of consideration when we're dealing with the patient, you know, with cultural humility, uh, language proficiency, emotional state, all those sorts of things, which again, this is not a complete listing. And then of course, what's really new with this paper with, with contextual factors is the encounter factors or what I call the ecosystem, right? The aspects, if you're familiar with, which m many of you are, of course, with systems-based medicine, right? It's, it's paying attention to the considerations of space, place, and time. So, or the ecosystem. So what's germane to that environment? So in athletic training, is it on a practice with nobody around and it's quiet, or is it in the middle of a state? with 100,000 people, the same injury, the same mechanism, the same patient, two different uh, ecosystems. Um, obviously, a student, a non-expert is going to have difficult challenges with those. Uh, is it in a clinic with a lot of people and a lot of buzz, a couple of teams getting ready to go out to game, to game day or, or to practice? Um, or, or are there a bunch of people watching this student training uh, who is supposed to know what they're doing? Um, so the encounter factors. So um, you, you can see that now we're getting to the point where even though the, the other model had a clinical reason was circular, we could stress that out and call it linear. So it's not a linear process, right? It's definitely a byproduct of multiple interactions occurring during a counter from, from day to day and brings in individuals, space, place, and time uh, within the environment. Most of you are familiar with this. You know, uh, you're all familiar with the biopsychosocial model. I love this graphic um, that I grabbed years ago, and I think it's probably more telling and it brings to brings to light the comments from the last paper, you know, the same patient obviously uh, can go from version one to version two to version three, maybe not on three different days, but certainly over the course of, of caring for that patient week one, three weeks later, week, four weeks later, uh, the consideration that the patient can change. But I, I think, you know, today and tomorrow and next week or whatever, um, those, those bubbles can change shape and the priorities will change. So obviously right away, you're realizing the patient is more uh, the same patient. It can be different based on a BPS model extended, but I think it's important to realize that us, that we, the clinicians also can change from day to day and we are humans and we do have the same effect. And then, of course, I think to really, really remember that the health professional student uh, obviously can can be the same. So I think that the addition here is to realize that from day to day, our BPS uh, can be fluid and change. Well, and when you know it, um, there's, you know, some literature revealing that interactions between patients, right, that therapeutic alliance has a big uh, role. So these these recent papers show that there's a considerable amount of, of outcome um, variance based on the relationship. So if there's a if there's documented, you know, twelve percent and uh, even more, uh, and with osteoarthritis and, and with other conditions, based on the relationship between the patient and the therapist, think about. Uh, what that means if we, if we combine these findings with the last model that the interactive effects, right? Uh, a, a statistician's dream or nightmare, depending on which way you look at it, trying to look at all the interactive effects between um, personalities uh, and state and trait between the caregiver and the patient. So I've talked for a bit, and you might be getting tired, but let's do a little do. A little do. So take your camera out and take a picture of this QR code and a Padlet screen should come up. Thank you, Sue Norcus, who I think is on air from Quinnipiac University. She's the one who exposed me to this Padlet idea a few years ago. In the lower right-hand corner should be a, a pink uh, circle with a plus. You tap that, and then um, there's directions at the top of the Padlet. So thinking about your work, you can take it one of two ways, either as a student or as a preceptor mentor, um, what kinds of contextual factors have you experienced that have impacted either your ability to learn something to do with clinical reasoning or your ability to teach a trainee? So think about specific events, moments, occurrences, dynamics, peoples within the ecosystem uh, in particular moments in time that you've either been trying to get your clinical reasoning assessed by someone and whether it's diagnostic or management and uh, or whether you're you're trying to take the time to address and assess a trainee's clinical reasoning. So take a few minutes uh, to do that and that, that will stay up and you can add to it as you go. And if we have time at the end, I'll, I'll pull the screen up and see what kind of results we have. So I'm curious as to what kind of experiences you folks all have with contextual interference, if you will, uh, things that might cause uh, stress uh, on the learning process.
So Cross Gary, the same year, coincidentally, came out of the paper where context is everything was the was the main lead. And so uh, these might be some of the answers that you're putting down. So he came out specifically and said, and again, mostly focusing on uh, diagnostic reasoning, that decision making challenges are influenced by by noise. And, it, and I, I got a a great line from Case Vandervluten when I was able to attend his programmatic assessment course at Maastricht a couple of years ago. And uh, it applies to so many things. He simply talked about signal versus noise. And if you want to get more signal, try to either minimize the noise through validity and psychometric assessment or simply increase your signal, collect more data. So you think about all the variances, causes of north, noise, excuse me, here, you know, the environment, the ambience, uh, the affect of both patient, clinician, et cetera, those sorts of things. And, and cultural humility is another one that should be added to that list. And he, he kind of summits this paper with uh, a really strong statement that if we don't reconstruct um, context reliably, um, it's a major impediment to learning. So we though when we become experts or along that way, we we do that. We take on that that training, that that habitual habit of geez, what did I miss? How did I miss that? Or how did I get that right? Right. So not to be always negative. How did I get that diagnosis right? It's because I recognized something, a certain key feature, or I adapted a special test or something in history that I dug deeper into. Um, but we do that as experts ourselves. So therefore to state the obvious, we should be focusing really highly on that with our students, right? To reconstruct the contextual reliability and get our students to realize that there are gray spaces and that that's where the deeper learning occurs. So um, really salient uh, advice from, from Cross Garrett. <clears throat> this is a little deeper paper from Kufidis et al. Um, that came out and really gets into more of a philosophical and, and semiotic kind of approach to clinical reasoning. But it, it, the paper is, is dealing with making sense of context. And so they really go a little deeper and they, they kind of represent this three tiered model of, of the representation. Right. And it kind of goes a little bit with the Bordage et al. paper earlier with the four categories of clinical reason. In this case, they kind of broke it down into three main angles. One is the problem solving and, and the clinical diagnostic reasoning part here and representation which of course connects deeply into the interpretation. How do you interpret the information from the assessment, physical exam and history and those sorts of things that might be re relevant and what might be missing. And then really what, where they go deep into the context part is the bottom of the foundational part here is the, and just, you see some of the similar terms now as I've already represented ecological psychology, situated cognition, uh, activity theory, and then of course natural decision-making. But to me, the key thing that I got out of this paper was, was this phrase is cognitive disjunctions, right? And so uh, that little padlet I had you do, um, what I, really what you were doing is, is identifying disjunctions, right? Things that get in the way of processing, information processing. Whether in our case, an athletic trainer, maybe it's a coach comes over on the sideline and yells at you. Is he ready to go back in the game? Right. Or I need him. I need him. I need him now. Right. And so we're doing better as an athletic training profession of holding that power and that decision making. But for a long time, we've had issues where young athletic trainers or students um, can get, you know, driven infected or impacted by coaches or um, sometimes by parents. I've had instances where parents is don't trust my decision and want me to put an athlete back into play uh, or those sorts of things. I've had instances where coaches have yelled at me to get a guy ready to go back into a game. Um, and maybe uh, when I was younger, I buckled under that pressure a little bit. So again, this also brings in IPP, right? Interprofessional practice and power dynamics and communications and roles, responsibilities. But when I learned this term from this paper, I started to really weave it into um, our curriculum here. And again, the Kufidis uh, summarizes things with, with another strong uh, statement about uh, context and clinical reasoning in order uh, to do better with our teaching. So another paper by Derning and Artino and folks in, in the same group, uh, there's that same model that they reproduced here, but uh, this is more of a study and they actually come up with four major, major findings. And the bottom line is that contextual factors can and do interfere with clinical reasoning performance. <laughs> Um, not just individually or singularly, um, but also the interactions, right? And that's where we have to really get dive down deeper in the weeds and, and loop back to our opening commentary about the need for common language and terminology and approaches and methodologies. Well, if we're going to, we, uh, cart or the horse, right? Do we, do we look at all the interactions and context first and that helps us better get that language and terminology or vice versa, uh, a kind of rhetorical question, asking for a friend there. So uh, they also basically come up with a point where we need to do better with uh, teaching what it is and those sorts of things. So um, this is an ex some examples I've mentioned a few already in athletic training. You know, parents sometimes don't know what athletic trainers are or, or they don't trust the athletic trainers decision or maybe they're physicians themselves. And sometimes they interact. Uh, I mentioned the coaches, uh, athletic trainers work 
in cooperation or supervision with a physician. And some physicians are great and respectful. Some physicians are more domineering and they control things. So that's a challenge for younger, more novice or pre-novice athletic trainers, clinicians. Uh, English as a second language obviously can, can be a source of cognitive disjunctions. Um, you know, the emotive state of, of athletes and getting them to calm down and redo assessment is, is a learned skill. Again, how do we apply certain clinical prediction rules? You know, the Ottawa ankle rules were first came out, which was 98% specific and sensitive for uh, ankle fractures. Uh, but, um, sorry, uh, timing. But uh, that, that was done with a group of people 18 to, to 55 years old. So how do you apply the contextual, uh, contextually apply uh, clinical prediction rules to a different demographic? So those are just some examples. Uh, you know, a busy athletic training room versus a quiet one that cause common cognitive dis disjunctions in athletic training settings. And I imagine you all know uh, various sorts that are that exist um, within medicine as well. So um, how does this this quote at the bottom is from one of the respondents, one of the physicians, which I think was really, really important. So this is one of the open address response. How does this contextual factor influence my decision making? Well, it all depends. So, uh, of course, I probably got really excited when, when I saw that based on the title of my talk. So this is the same paper. And there's a lot of great qualitative evidence from this paper about how context in, impacts uh, experts. So what can we do about it? Well, this Renchik model goes a long way. They basically found six um, key pillars, the rater, the, the patient case, the assessee, the assessment method in the task, which is really two in one there that you see in that model. And of course, the environment that, that all have dynamic interactions that go along with assessing someone's clinical reason performance. So um, th this paper is a great way, place to look um, for, how, okay, how can I start to look at a different model? And the table four in this paper brings up some of the interaction types on the left-hand side, uh, the contextual factors that may be Im impacting that interaction type, uh, and then some, some modifications that you might be able to make in your assessment and your teaching of, of, of learning. So again, you see the same names there. So I would refer you to that paper. And then this, this model, I think, is really helpful as well from Born et al. in 2021. Again, there's a lot of stuff coming out, so it's exciting. Now, they used something called Smith's model for predictive validity of clinical performance and came up with a hy hybrid approach. Basically, what they found is there's three different types of, 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 uh, of skills, and the occupational one that is the one I'll focus on the most. And so they say that clinical reasoning is a generic occupational skill, right? Because all healthcare providers have to do it. All physicians have to do it, all, all healthcare providers. So I'm dialing in on the generic occupational one and they, they come up with kind of a, a, a hybrid inductive deductive approach. And they simply say inductively, um, you know, I know there's been sub-nested EPAs in, in the uh, milestones for clinical consultation. So using that kind of model of, of sub-nested EPAs for clinical reasoning. So instead of assessing clinical reasoning once, right? That's, that's kind of logical, but not just assessing clinical reasoning four or five times in the same setting, in the emergency room, in the same context, simply create a series of sub-nest EPA assessments and assess their clinical reasoning in different contexts. Right? Again, more signal, uh, less noise, and you get a stronger signal. So in maybe in the emergency room, maybe on a neuro consult, maybe under, under psych, uh, maybe with an English second language patient, uh, with a large family member present, right, creating all kinds of cognitive disjunctions. So um, athletic training can do this in uh, uh, different contexts that I, that I explained examples of before. And if it's a hybrid approach, use a deductive approach and simply look at a longitudinal clinical reason and curriculum plan and figure out and identify which assessment measures, some formative, some summative in your program that you collect that are not work-based assessment. So it may be based on uh, case presentations and those sorts of things, OSCEs, standardized patients, those sorts of things. So this hybrid deductive deductive model works, uh, has a lot of potential for those curriculum designers looking to create a longitudinal, excuse me, uh, clinical reasoning uh, program. So I would refer you to the Born paper for more details on that. And then just, just to kind of keep beating uh, the system or, or the concept, another very recent paper, uh, but calls for a need for an, a, a adapting our curricula. And again, if we need to do it in medicine, we clearly need to do it in athletic training. If we need to do it in medicine, I'm guessing we clearly need to do it in PT and OT and other healthcare fields as well, though I can't say that as uh, firsthand. But um, so another source there. Um, this is from that, that paper on third big reasoning and their conclusions are strong. Management reasoning requires different educational approaches and diagnostic reasoning. We can't just teach diagnostic reasoning and expect our students to transfer that to management reasoning. 
uh, we know through literature that clinical reasoning has to be taught. We can't just assume it happens. So uh, how is it integrated throughout the curriculum to students? Do they know the terminology? Do they know the processes? Do they know the differences? Um, so the model I presented is what I used at Ithaca College uh, for athletic training education for years. Uh, in the first two weeks of our orthopedic, year-long orthopedic assessment class, I teach them that model and go through all the differences so that when clinically I'm talking to a student about an assessment they did with a patient, I can say, look, I'm focusing in here on your management reasoning. What, what went into your decisions for that care plan? So we need a lot more research and a lot more attention. So here's some questions. This is actually a, an actual slide that I've given my preceptors and my faculty when you want to assess uh, therapeutic reasoning, um, trying to get to the basic sciences behind uh, a problem uh, separately or differentially, getting to the clinical sciences behind the problem. So these are questions uh, and conversational uh, entry points for you and your students. Um, what is the relevant evidence for the intervention you're considering if we have it, you know, for ultrasound or, or electrical stimulation or cupping or fascial mobilizations, whatever you're, you're using therapeutically. Um, what do you think you're gonna get out of this? Um, how is this patient's condition progress different than others of similar nature, even though it's the same diagnosis, it doesn't mean it's the same reasoning process. And then a great question is, can you think of other ways, right? So kind of like uh, asking for a friend rhetorical conversation. And, and again, that's, this comes into play because if, if someone goes to Ithaca College, they have all the resources available to them in study 18, then they go to a high school and they don't have them. Um, how are they gonna get the same therapeutic effect without the same uh, resources? And then for context, taking a step further, maybe more advanced students, um, bringing into play patient values, their disposition, um, their, their current state. How does that impact your intended plan? And again, reflecting all the literature now that we know about contextual factors, um, what's going on here that might make this more difficult or that may have impacted the, your, your intended outcomes? Uh, this paper, if you're looking for great ways to assess clinical reasoning, you see here that uh, a very large review, it's a great paper uh, in 2019, the wider the block, the lower the number, excuse me, the higher the number, the wider the block, um, the more uh, valid and, and assessed the measure is for clinical reasoning. So there you see work-based assessment. Those of you who can do this for a long time, no surprise. But what's also nice about this is you see management reasoning over here in the far right column. So this doesn't, this paper doesn't just look at diagnostic reasoning, it also assesses the strength and the utility of various management reasoning tools. I referenced this Kufidis paper a while ago, and I think what you see here is a great quote that assessing uh, clinical reasoning is basically un impossible without looking at context. And you see a lot of really key words here. You see theory, you see knowledge, you see evidence-based, you see practical reason, you see capability. I'm a big fan of Fraser and Greenhall's model of capability for uh, in combination with competence. Um, you see uh, mastery, you see context, you see capacity, and of course you see thought and, and discourse. So Summing that up, uh, clinical reasoning in health professions education, I think there's still persistent confusion and varied language. We, there's still literature coming out to show that, and most of our attention is on diagnostic reasoning. Let's focus a little bit more on uh, a more holistic model that incorporates therapeutic reasoning, that also incorporates contextual reasoning with our trainees, both didactically and clinically. Uh, let's build a, a cohesive framework that identifies those three columns, at least, maybe there's more than three, and make sure that when you work with students, whether it's in class or clinically, you, you know which part of reason you're talking about, and so that they understand they're focusing on a DXR, or TXR, or CXR, and where can you go for help, whether it's the Wrenchick model that's embedded here that I talked about, uh, which is a cognitive model, there's the born hybridized model between deductive and inductive, and then maybe the adaptive ecosystems model that I presented here today. Um, is a place to start um, to create and address some of those uh, solutions. I just want to thank everyone for joining us today. I want to thank Paul in particular for a great talk and uh, look forward to seeing you all if you can make it for future talks here in the BEI. And we welcome more and more connections uh, with our neighbors down the street and with Simmons. Thank you again, Paul, so much uh, for today. Thank you. Cheers, everybody. Be well.